Okay, our last speaker is uh, Paul Griffiths, who's come from a great distance to join us, the University of Sydney oh, in Australia. Paul is very, very well known among philosophers of biology throughout the world. He has a number of superb books on philosophy of biology, and he also is editor of one of the classic texts in philosophy of biology. Probably many of you also know that uh, Paul is president-elect of the International Society for the History, Philosophy, and Social Studies of Biology. So, welcome, Paul. Thank you. Um, well, this is definitely going to be a change of gear from the last two talks. Um, <clears throat> in his introductory remarks at the conference, Phil Sloan said that he'd put me here to make a bridge between the biological and philosophical discussion today and the more explicitly uh, theological discussion tomorrow morning. Um, now, I have no pretensions whatever to an understanding of theology, but I shall do my best to make such a bridge. The uh, paper that I'm uh, basing these comments on is a, a joint project with John Wilkins, who some of you will be hearing talk in the parallel sessions tomorrow. Um, and John and I have been worrying about the uh, parallels and the similarities and differences between evolutionary debunking arguments offered in different intellectual domains. So I want to start with these two incredibly famous quotes from Darwin that most of you will be familiar with. Um, the famous passage from Descent of Man in which Darwin <coughs> discusses uh, a certain kind of moral skepticism, moral skepticism that might arise if we come to believe that uh, the content of our ethics is a function of the particular ecology of our species. If we had a different ecology, we would expect to have different uh, ethical beliefs. Second passage, um, not quite as well known, although widely quoted. Um, it just comes from a letter um, in which Darwin is discussing our capacity to have true metaphysical beliefs. And he takes the view that while natural selection might very well have made us uh, very reliable at finding food and finding mates, it's unlikely to have given us much capacity to do metaphysics. Something of a contrast between that remark and the more famous one where he talks about he who would understand baboon would do more towards metaphysics than Locke. I wonder how Darwin would have actually put a mature, mature version of that view forward. I don't think actually too much weight should be put on this particular remark in any kind of analysis of Darwin's thought, but it, it's a nice example of a, a way of thinking that many other people have, have found tempting. So what we've got here is skepticism about two very different intellectual domains based on the view that our beliefs about those domains are the product of adaptation and natural selection. A uh, nice uh, forthcoming paper by Guy Kahan at Oxford gives the general form of an evolutionary debunking argument, which goes something like this. Well, Kahan actually applies this only to moral beliefs. Um, but it's, I think he'd, I'm sure he'd accept that it's a general form. Um, so we start with this premise. Our evolutionary history explains why we have the X beliefs that we have, beliefs on topic X. Evolution is not a truth-tracking process with respect to X truth or X truths, perhaps. Therefore, none of our X beliefs are justified. And three prominent domains in which arguments of this kind have been suggested are morality, religion, and a kind of combination of common sense and scientific belief. The largest philosophical literature is probably devoted to a kind of moral skepticism based on this sort of an argument. Um, perhaps the most uh, best known person in that field these days is my colleague at Sydney, Richard Joyce. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today are possible ways in which one can counter evolutionary debunking arguments and the ways in which those counters work or don't work depending on the particular domain of beliefs that we're concerned with. So I'm going to suggest that there is a, a counter to an evolutionary debunking argument that works very nicely for science and common sense, um, but is perhaps more problematic for religion. And I'll briefly mention a, a standard strategy that's used to defuse evolutionary debunking arguments about morality and point out that that one also is more problematic in the case of religion. Okay, um, so the strategy that I want to concentrate mainly on is one which bridges 
connection, makes a connection between truth and fitness. So the general form of an evolutionary debunking argument is to say our beliefs are tracking biological fitness, they're not tracking truth. Standard way of pointing that out is that there are many situations in which error can lead you to do fairly well. Um, I mean, my favorite example is the uh, uh, results uh, in psychology suggesting that the people with the most accurate perceptions of their own say, social status and likely future success are mildly depressed. So it would seem that the most functional kind of human psychology is one in which you slightly but not radically overestimate how much people like you and how well you're likely to do in your life. <laughs> um, and I think it's very easy to make adaptive sense of how um, there's a lovely quote in, in Machiavelli about how a wise um, man always shoots above the mark in order that his arrow will reach the target. And some massive kind of evolution psychology story in the spirit of that remark might make sense of this interesting piece of, uh, of, of personality theory. So you get the general idea. So a way to reply to an evolutionary debunking argument is to say, I've got some kind of a bridge, a bridge which links the truth of my beliefs with their fitness. So we might say that what we need is a bridge principle. What the X truths are is related in some suitable way to which X beliefs are fitted. Now, it doesn't have to be that they're the same as the fittest beliefs, but they've got to stand in some systematic relation of a kind that is going to give us some degree of reliability or verisimilitude or some other proximate truth-like kind of property. Now, John and I like to refer to these bridge principles as Milvian bridges. Um, in memory of one of the most famous examples of somebody attempting to argue that what you believe is strongly correlated with your success. Namely, uh, the view that it was when the uh, Emperor Constantine changed his beliefs about what religious ideas were true that his military strategy became successful. Um, and as the famous quote has it, in this sign conquer. Um, now, very few people today are prepared to endorse a uh, Milvian bridge argument in the most literal sense. Uh, I think it's a, an argument that became much less attractive after the uh, loss of the eastern provinces under the Emperor Heraclius. Um, but uh, this kind of argument, actually I would argue, I would say this kind of argument continues to have massive uh, kind of vulgar appeal in the case of religious beliefs. I remember many years ago when uh, that sort of eccentric thing that they do in Britain that my uh, uh, philosophy of science supervisor at Cambridge decided I should go to Khartoum to study Islamic philosophy for a couple of weeks. And I didn't learn very much because as a brash young undergraduate with very little background, you don't acquire a great deal of knowledge on that sort of occasion. But I do remember being amazed um, the extent to which confidence in the truth of certain kinds of religious claims seem to have risen and have waxed and waned with the success and then the retreat of Western imperialism in North Africa, which I take to be a vulgar application of this argument. However, I'm going to argue that while it might not work very well in its original context, something like that makes quite a lot of sense when we think about evolutionary debunking arguments about common sense and science. In the case of science, there may be a successful Milvian bridge. Um, what I want to do is just to examine a little more carefully this idea that natural selection only selects our beliefs for their adaptiveness and not for their truth. And fortunately, I'm helped out here by a, a brilliant, simple, short little nugget of a paper by Peter Godfrey Smith, which came out um, some decades ago. Um, Godfrey Smith was interested in some of the early in, in a discussion of uh, the semantics of, uh, of mental states, uh, there was a tradition in the 1980s, a number of philosophers arguing that you could understand the semantics of mental states in terms of selection for truth. So the content of a mental state would be the state of affairs in the world that it was selected to correspond to. And Peter was coming along and pointing, Godfrey Smith was coming along and pointing out that's actually a very naive view and introducing this obvious idea that rather than our mental states being selected for corresponding to the world, 
they're selected to have whatever content is most fitness enhancing. However, um, what he did was to take us a little further along that thought by giving a simple biological model, which is actually a real biological model used for other purposes in biology, which allows us to think through what that difference between fitness tracking and truth tracking amounts to in reality. Um, so this is a, a very simple signal decision model. Um, it's extremely simple. Uh, so what we've got here is the probability of a certain state of affairs obtaining um, and, sorry, on that axis. And what we've got here is the value of some kind of a signal that the organism wants to use in order to find out whether that state of affairs obtains. And we've got two probability distributions here. And this one is the probability of the state of, sorry, the probability of receiving a particular value of this signal, x, if, uh, sorry, and receiving it if it's noise. So signal x can either be noise or signal. Here's the probability that you'll get a given value of x from noise. And here's the probability that you'll get a given value of x from signal. And the two distributions are overlapping. So there are some values of the signal where you can, if you, you're getting a signal of two, you can be pretty sure it's, you can be sure it's noise. There are some values, if you're getting 17, you can be sure it's signal. And there's a range of values in the middle where it could either be noise or signal with different probabilities. And what we've got here is just one example of an optimum, optimum value for deciding to treat this incoming signal as signal rather than noise. Okay, so this is one particular value given a certain set of, um, of numbers for where you might decide. And if you want to talk about this very anthropocentrically, uh, this might, what this is telling you is that the, you, will, you will, if you're optimally designed, then if the signal strength exceeds 11, you will come to believe the relevant thing and act on that basis. Now, the point which uh, Godfrey Smith makes about this model is that that optimum value is a function of a payoff matrix in which you look at the relative value of acting or not acting if you're wrong and if you're right. Basically, what you're doing is trading off, in, in statistical terms, you're trading off type 2 errors and type 1 errors. You've, you can't, for um, straightforward reasons, simply decide to always believe what's true without paying the price of sometimes not believing something when it is true. Okay, you say, I, I, oh, if, if you decide I am only ever going to form a belief when my belief is true, you'll have to set your threshold somewhere like here, and then there'll be lots of occasions when the state of affairs obtains, but you don't believe in it because you can't be absolutely certain. And if you decide that you always want to form a belief when the state of affairs obtains, you have to set your threshold here. And the result is that frequently you'll believe that it obtains when it doesn't obtain. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You've got to accept either more type 1 errors or more type 2 errors. And the optimum threshold is set by simply looking at the relative benefit of the four possible outcomes, believing it when it is true, believing it when it isn't true, not believing it when it's true, and believing it when it isn't true. And you can scale this up to multiple sources of information and build much more complicated versions, but the fundamental logic is, is the same. So that's the basic logic of the relationship between truth tracking and fitness tracking. And the simple point I want to make about it is this, that although all we're concerned with here is how can the organism optimize its fitness, how can it choose to form beliefs in a way that optimizes its fitness, you can't think about this problem without systematically thinking about when does the organism get it right and when does the organism get it wrong. I mean, the payoff matrix, those four numbers I was just talking about, are generated by distinguishing between situations in which the organism acts as if the world is a particular way and the world is that way, or acts as if the world is not a particular way and the world is not that way or perhaps is that way. Okay? So, if you think about, in the, case of com in the case of descriptive beliefs about how the world is, and you take seriously this idea, well, 
really all evolution cares about is whether your beliefs are maximally adaptive, then you can't help but think about whether your beliefs are true. It's, of course, correct that evolution is not going to select you so as to always form true beliefs, but it's going to select, to select organisms which form beliefs that have a systematic relationship to truth, a relationship mediated by the payoffs of different kinds of error. So it's fundamentally normative and epistemic all the way through, even though it's purely concerned with adaptation. So what I want to argue is that that constitutes a, a suitable kind of Milvian bridge. The fact that there's a systematic relationship between whether you're getting it right and whether you're evolutionarily rewarded is enough to, to get us out of an evolutionary debunking argument in the case of common sense. Very quickly, I just want to talk about what kind of, does that give us a license for a kind of evolutionary scientific realism? And I want to explain the sense in which it, it doesn't give us a license for a kind of evolutionary scientific realism. Um, to do this, I just want to jump very briefly to, to this guy that some of you will be familiar with, Jakob von Uxkull, and his concept of Umwelt. Now, it's a sad fact that the idea of the Umwelt has become uh, trendy in a lot of contemporary uh, philosophy, particularly uh, well, it's among semioticians. Um, that's not a, a, a reason for my introducing it here. Uh, I think if you want to understand von Uxkoll's notion of an Umwelt, and if you want to understand why he says things that sound anti-reductionist and anti-mechanist, you just have to re remember that he's a contemporary of Jacques Loeb and locate him in a kind of early 20th century debate about mechanism and vitalism and so forth, um, and certainly not um, mix him up with a whole bunch of, of stuff in semiotics. Uh, my own interest in von Uxkull came from being interested in Conrad Lorenz, who uh, has a very down-to-earth view of, of von Uxkull's contribution. So what is this idea? The idea of the Umwelt in, in this kind of down-to-earth, kind of the way in which Lorenz understood it, uh, is simply the idea that in order to understand how an organism is operating successfully in the world, you have to recognize that the organism has its own ontology, its own kind of conceptual scheme in, with which it moves around in the world. Um, Lorenz's particular example of that, which he dedicated to von Uxkull, was the idea that when a bird operates in the world, it doesn't typically operate by seeing the world as consisting of enduring objects with a single identity, people, nests, offspring, and eggs. Rather, it constructs the world as, ha as a, a series of configurations of stimuli, each of which draw forth a certain body of behavior. And until you, you look at the, the, the world in that way, with an ontology of stimulus arrays which call forth particular behaviors, rather than enduring objects, you won't be able to make much sense, much sense of how certain behaviors are being epistemically, sorry, how certain ways of thinking are epistemically optimal for, for the bird acting in the world. The point I want to make is quite simple, that the sort of Milvian bridge for uh, for descriptive beliefs that I've just been trying to build is going to be one that applies to every Umwelt equally. That it's not going to make us realist about the world of com human common sense in any way that we're also not realist about the world of bird common sense, the world of um, bacterial common sense, the world of, uh, well, in von Uxkull's famous example, the, the common sense world of parasitic ticks which I think is supposed to have roughly two parameters. Uh, a very simple world. Um, so if we think about our common sense to more, think about G.E. Moore's common sense as simply the umwelt of human beings, then the kind of argument that I've been sketching means that we should be realists about our umwelt and about the umwelt of every other kind of organism and any kind of realism which discriminates in favor of one way of uh, chopping the world up over another is going to be a form of realism that's too strong to be supported by the kind of Milvian bridge that I've been constructing. Okay, so to finish off, um, I want to consider this slightly uh, um, pessimistic scenario. Um, so first of all, I want to suggest that the particular kind of Milvian bridge that I've been suggesting we can construct for common sense and science is one that we're not likely to be able to construct for specifically religious beliefs. 
Um, I've argued that our common sense beliefs allow us to act successfully in the world and that that makes a link between fitness tracking and truth tracking. Um, I don't think that's, unless we're prepared to buy uh, the, uh, the original Milvian bridge, bridge argument, um, something that's going to work out for our theological beliefs. Now I want to look at a completely the opposite strategy, which is the obvious strategy to take when confronted by an evolutionary debunking argument for religion. And this is uh, Kahan's version. So we have this view about our moral or normative, he says, evaluative beliefs. Our evolutionary history explains, remember Darwin, explains why we don't believe that we have a sacred duty to uh, murder our fertile sisters. Um, okay? Uh, evolution is not a truth-tracking process with respect to evaluative truth. There doesn't seem to be any um, way of fitting uh, that into the picture. And then this meta-ethical assumption. So Kahan's point is that in order to get from here to skepticism about our moral beliefs, we need this assumption that our evaluative discourse is trying to describe a mind-independent moral reality. And the typical way in which somebody in, in ethics wants to get around uh, an evolutionary debunking argument is, for example, by saying that uh, moral properties are response-dependent properties in some sense defined in terms of the moral sense, perhaps of an ideal observer. There are many different versions of the strategy. But by, by, as it were, deflating your moral properties to, into some form in which they, the truth of moral claims is constituted by their acceptance by a certain kind of organism, you deny this premise and block this hidden premise and block the transition from these debunking premises to the debunking conclusion. So if you think that uh, you can give an adequate account of the content of moral statements in terms of the, uh, the uh, moral intuitions of an idealized human observer, then you might have a way of getting out of an evolutionary debunking argument. What I want to suggest is that that strategy is also less attractive for theological beliefs because it would mean giving up the idea that our theological claims are claims about a mind-independent and human-independent theological realm, and that's something which looks less attractive in theology. I, not that I have any pretensions to know about that. seems to me it's li likely to seem less attractive than some kind of uh, moral quasi-realism seems to many contemporary ethical theorists. So there are two ways out, one of which looks pretty attractive for science, the other of which looks pretty attractive in ethics, Neither of them seems a particularly attractive way to evade an evolutionary debunking argument, specifically in the realm of theology. Thank you. Does Wrzeciński Lublin, uh, do you think that there must be necessarily a conflict between truth and fitness? One must not introduce such a necessity. Why? They could coexist. And uh, both our intellectual conviction and our pragmatic approach to fitness problems, uh, it seems uh, important for, for our life. And f uh, in my conviction of the country which passed through Nazis' experience and through communist totalitarian system, Umwelt is not the most important value, definitely not. <laughs> How to prove it that Umwelt uh, is, is uh, the highest value? There were people who suffered, who were in prison, because they were going to transcendent values toward the Umwelt. How, so how to prove? And how to prove your epistemic premise that, uh, that uh, evolutionary process that uh, does not uh, preserve truth? If it were true, then not only science and religion will be without true, but our conference and particular papers will be truthless. 
So would you agree that the uh, meta statement, uh, no uh, epistemic meta statement, no uh, truth could be discovered in our scientific debates refers also to what we are doing now. Thank you, that's a really interesting set of, no, I think there are really three questions there which I'll kind of answer in increasing order of their importance. Um, first of all, the, uh, it's of course absolutely right that uh, one of my great embarrassments is that I am an enormous fan of the work of Conrad Lorenz and that it is undeniable that Lorenz was up to his ears in an, uh, an unforgivable involvement with Nazism which he embraced with an enthusiasm that can hardly be underestimated. Um, and he did indeed make use of his brilliant scientific insights in the service of a ridiculous and bankrupt racial science project in the 1940s. Um, so I agree that some of these ideas, like the idea of Umwelt, have some unpleasant historical associations, and I'm committed to showing that their scientific use and value can be made independent of that. Um, so, but I accept that that is a, a, an imp int a important thing to, to recall. Um, the uh, final point uh, that you made um, is now slipping my mind, so I'll just skip to the most important one, the one that you started with. Um, fitness and truth. The whole point of, oh, of course, yeah, uh, okay. The, the whole point of what I've been trying to do here is to try and forge a standing connection between fitness and truth in the face of an argument that prima facie seems to, to split them apart. Um, the, the trouble is that, I mean, there's, there's just a fundamental issue, which is that um, by truth, we mean a correspondence between what we believe and how the world is. And it's just a fundamental logical fact that optimizing that relationship carries a cost and it's a cost that we should also be concerned about. Namely, in order to, be, to only believe the true, you would have to be um, more ignorant than you could otherwise be. The way to always believe the true is to be incredibly cautious in what you believe. And if you're incredibly cautious in what you believe, then you will miss out on many opportunities to, by taking a small risk, believe some more true things. Okay, if you want to, you can't, uh, it's a basic bit of logic that uh, you can't, as, as a human agent relying on empirical information, always believe what's true and believe everything that's true. You have to trade these two off. Um, that's just basic logic. Uh, and so what I've been suggesting is that when you've made that trade-off, um, there's nevertheless a fundamental role for truth in explaining why a certain trade-off is the right or the optimum trade-off. And that's my basic response to the view that all we care about is fitness. First of all, thanks a lot. I think I might be asking the opposite question, which I'm afraid might make me a bad person, so I apologize. But. Um, I, th I think I was pretty well persuaded by your your argument about the connection between uh, truth and fitness as uh, as probably being correlated and being able to give an evolutionary account for that. But I'm wondering if that might not give us some additional uh, ammunition to reprise the skepticism about both morality and religion uh, if we consider the following uh, possibilities. Uh, First of all, if we consider these things as, as forms of reasoning which historically have been pretty closely tied together, especially if let's just focus on Western uh, science and knowledge for now, mm -hmm. so that we've used similar kinds of arguments and similar kinds of truth claims in science and religion and, and, and ethics. Um, of course, with science, we're dealing, especially the natural sciences, we're dealing with a world that hasn't, the laws of the world that haven't changed a lot over the last 30 or 40,000 years, or however we want to trace back our uh, cognitive styles of thinking. Uh, you know, we, you know, our, our basic biological makeup, uh, which won't be true when we talk about the worlds that religion and morality want to talk about. So I guess a, a revised skeptic might come back and make two points, right? One might be, it might be the case that the kinds of rules which we've used to uh, think about the world in terms of science have been pretty good at one point for thinking about religion and morality. But given the fact that these are cultural phenomena that occur in a world that changes much more quickly than the natural world, 
they might not still be very good, even though biologically or uh, culturally we're still inclined to accept them. Uh, I think Nietzsche probably makes that argument. Uh, the second claim we could make, and Nietzsche might make this one too, is that it might be the case that although when we talk about what makes our beliefs true, we're pretty much tracking fitness, when we use that same set of arguments to explain why certain beliefs are good or uh, about uh, metaphysical questions in general, let's not say just religion, that uh, the kinds of reasons that are gonna be persuasive are gonna be totally different, and yet we're still gonna be inclined to accept the same kinds of arguments that we, we accept uh, with science and common sense. So how would I avoid these two skepticism, these, these sort of two new forms of skepticism? Okay, um, well, first of all, uh, as I was trying to say on, on the penultimate slide, I think uh, responses to moral skepticism require a very different uh, strategy from responses to skepticism about uh, common sense and scientific belief. Um, main response to your, your point about change, uh, as um, John was pointing out to me earlier today, it's critical to remember that uh, at least, you know, let's just start off from the current state of discussions of the evolution of human cognitive faculties. And one of the main ideas on the table at the moment, um, as represented in my um, uh, former teacher Kim Sterelny's uh, book title, Thought in a Hostile World, um, one of the main ideas on the table at the moment is that one of the primary selective pressures leading to the evolution of advanced cognitive faculties is that you're surrounded by other organisms who are trying to lie to you and exploit you. Um, one of the reasons that you need sophisticated cognitive systems um, is that other organisms are giving you, si signaling lots of information to you and they don't share your interests. Okay, you can't just, you know, when you don't say to you, know, the other organism comes up to you and says, I am absolutely enormous and there's no point competing with me for mates. It would be very silly to say, well, that's a reliable source. Let's just take that at face value. Um, okay, so if you think that uh, one of the main sources of um, uh, selection on, high, on the development of higher cognitive faculties is intraspecific competition, um, then you'd think, in fact, that uh, there's been as much recent evolutionary change in the pressures operating there as there has been in the other two domains. Um, but on the other hand, basically, I mean, I, I, um, uh, I think what you're saying is sound. I do think that it's a completely different replying to uh, evolution debunking arguments about morality is best served by rethinking the uh, kind of realism you want to have about moral properties until it becomes something that's more um, easier to fit into a an evolutionary worldview, um, and I think there are lots of programs to do that. Um, and the, uh, as for metaphysics, I mean, that's w insofar as we should take that quote from Darwin seriously, that's exactly what he was saying. Um, Darwin was saying, and in fact, in that way, Darwin and G.E. Moore are very close together when Moore says, um, you know, nothing that F.H. Bradley has ever argued could, could reasonably come close to my belief that I have two hands, that there are some material objects. Darwin is saying something like, I have confidence for evolutionary reasons in our ability to navigate the world of common sense and to make reasonable decisions on those matters. But when, and he's discussing uh, um, whether or not it's a necessary or contingent matter that there is something rather than nothing. And it's of that question that he says, you know, I wonder whether any monkey is likely to be very good at thinking about that kind of issue. It seems like if that's true, then maybe the, the, uh, the meta assumption that you had there of, of that moral values are understood objectively or that religious values are understood objectively or metaphysical values are understood objectively doesn't describe historically the kind of skepticism, I mean, it might describe the kind of skepticism that, that you know, contemporary evolutionary psychologists are making, but they're, they're, you know, I mean, again, I'd use the example of Nietzsche, somebody who was deeply influenced by Darwin, developed a very interesting form of moral skepticism, but one that didn't depend on the idea that our morality wanted to pick out objective facts. Um, in fact, he was relying on the idea that our morality was functioning in a kind of pragmatic way, very similar to the way that you're describing truth function. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's my concern. Okay, now, now I think I see where you're coming from. That's a really interesting point. Yeah. 